The name of this sermon is All of Me for All of You. Now, I don't know if I read that or I thought of it, but I wrote it down anyway, and I said, All of Me for All of You. And if you want a catchphrase to explain what Jesus did for us, this one would work. Peter was writing his letters to call out people who were saying, well, where is the Messiah who was promised? Things continue as they always did, and so we don't have anything to worry about on his account. What a mistake they were making, and Peter was hammering it home. See, there was two things going on. This, the, the first was that, that some believe that the Messiah had or would had or would not didn't believe that Messiah had or would come, and judgment would be meted out for them. And the second thing that was happening, you see, let me rephrase that first thing. They didn't think he was coming. Nothing was going to happen. But the second thing that was happening was he had come. It, he was here. He'd come, and judgment would be meted out in the whole world. Well, we have mockers all around us, too. They pick away at everything that was considered by the world for the last thousands of years as normal, and they're saying, oh, no, no, we've got to change all of this. We've got, we got to fix it. Now, it's been going on for 200 years. It's called the Age of Enlightenment, and it continues to manifest what Peter was saying. People are saying there's nothing going to happen, it's all, it's, it's, it's not going to fix, nothing's going to change. And Charles Darwin learned this at his father's knee, that nothing is going to change, God didn't change, God didn't make this, we don't have to account to him. And even though he trained to be a pastor, he moved away from that and he wrote the, his book, called The Origin of the Species in 1859, and it was a great success. And um, the scientific community had no problem with it. They latched onto that, like that's the greatest idea ever, that's how things happen. And do you know how lots of companies are changing the name to be initials? BMO is Bank of Montreal. RBC is Royal Bank. Lots of other companies did that too. And this happened with the title of his book. It's been shortened to The Origin of the Species. What people don't remember is it's a long title. It's called, the full name is On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. If you, meet, if you read that last part, the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life, well, people latched onto that. Scientists said, oh yeah, I'm one of those favored races and I can pick some that aren't. And what happened was, soon after the, uh, he wrote his book, the theory of eugenics became a science. And what that was is that smart, Talented, skilled scientists should help evolution along. And that, you know that that's going to go wrong, right? And because they're going to weed out the inferior people. Racism got a big booster shot with evolution because it came up with a scientific reason to hate other people. Darwin's evolution taught that there were five races, and these five races evolved at different rates. And of course, it goes without saying that the, they, he would say the white race is the one that evolved the fastest, and the other races were much slower. You might not know that in school it was taught that the black race was just a little bit more evolved than apes and baboons. And you can know, you, you can easily figure out how that affected that, that race. Now, Stephen Jay Gould, you may remember his name, he was an, uh, an important and, and famous evolutionist, 
in, um, a number of years ago, and he wrote this in his book, Ontogeny and Pyrogeny. What, I have no idea what those two words are. Um, they're just fancy scientific words, but this is what he wrote. Biological arguments for racism may have been common before 1859, that's when Darwin's book came out, but they increased by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of the evolutionary theory. And so I looked up what orders of magnitude means. An order of magnitude is whatever your number is, you multiply it by 10. That's one order of magnitude. Multiply it, a second order of magnitude would be multiplied by a hundred. A third would be multiplied by a thousand. He's saying that racism was this big before Darwin wrote his book. Afterwards it was, well, you, you, you figure out how big it was. The U.S. and Canada and Europe all dabbled in eugenics. And they said that if you were handicapped, mentally handicapped, it's okay to sterilize you so you won't have children. And lots of Native women were sterilized, because obviously they're not the favored race. Now, the group that really sank their teeth into it was the Nazi party, and the, the scientists and the doctors were fully on board. And we all know where that went. The truth of the Bible says there's only one race, Adam and Eve, and everyone descended from them. So if you believe that, there's no place for racism to go. Now, it's all a natural consequences of what Peter was saying. If you ignore Jesus and say it's all continuing as it always did, then the natural consequences is his voice can be ignored and dismissed. From that comes the thought that all these rules about sex and all everything else can be dismissed. If, if they're not what we want, we don't want them. I had a funny conversation with a woman at work. Um, we rented something from United Rentals, and it went six months, and they kept sending us bills, and I kept saying, look, this bill is not right, and finally I got in touch with somebody, and he said, I'm going to fix it. Five months had passed, and so the bill is again set on my desk and said, Peter, fix this. So I called and left a message, and he said, look, I apologize. I've been out for five months, and I told you I was going to look after it, and, and, but we're going to fix it today. And I said, okay, good, finally. So anyway, I was talking to Kathy, and I said, he was out for five months, and I didn't know, I don't know why he was out. And I said, maybe he had a baby. And she said, yes, men can take maternity leave. And I said, no, no, men can have babies now, too. I said, you can self-identify as whatever you want. And now doctors and nurses in the maternity ward are taught to say birthing person as opposed to mother because you can be a man. And she said, what's the world coming to? And I said, I don't know, but it's not coming to God. It's moving away from God. And that's what this text is about. Peter was warning the church that false teachers were coming. And so be on your guard. And we can do that, this, the false teachers are still around. They didn't all die out in Peter's time. So let's look at the passage. Number one, another reminder. Verse one and two says, And now, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you, in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder, that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commands of the Lord and the Savior spoken by your apostles. Well, we see these letters from Peter and we think, yeah, that's, I like that, it's good information. But we forget that he had a limited lifespan. He knew that he was going to die and he was taking his time to write these letters because he knew that wolves would come to steal their assurance. He knew 
And the devil knows that he can't steal your salvation. Your, your salvation is assured, but he can steal other things from you. He can steal your confidence in the truth. He can steal your resolve to keep yourself pure and obedient to the will of the Lord. He can steal your willingness to share your most valuable possession, which is your salvation, the truth of salvation that everyone needs to hear. He's always trying to steal the effectiveness of the church and stop them from using their greatest gift, which is love. Well, Peter is writing this to say this is nothing new. This is all the, the prophets told this, the disciples told this, this information has been around forever. But he knew he would die soon, and he wanted his his church, the people of the church, to continue in the love of the Lord. And as it happens, they did. Or we wouldn't have the Bible in our language. We wouldn't have all these words saved for us. So he was saying, be on your guard. False teachers are coming, and we can be on the same. He wanted the church to hold fast to the truth and resist the scoffers. In, in verse 13 of chapter 2, it says, They counted a pleasure to revel in the daylight, daytime. They are stains and blemishes, revealing it, reveling in their deceptions as they carouse with you. See, these were people of the, that came to church, that were part of the church, that were pulling the church away, having eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin, enticing unstable souls, having a heart trained in greed, accursed children, forsaking the right way, they've gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam. And in verse 17 it says, They are springs without water and mist driven by a storm, for whom black, the black darkness has been reserved. And verse 19 says, Promising them freedom, they have themselves their slaves of corruption. You see, these people were in the church, and Peter was saying, Look, I only got a certain amount of time, but I want to warn you that they're there. They're trying to pull you away. Now, number two is scoffers come and scoffers go. Verse 3 to 6 says, Knowing the fir that first of all, in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that the, by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at the time was destroyed, being flooded with water. I used to go to exercise at Hillside Church. We had a Mondays and Thursdays, and that was before COVID, obviously. <laughs> Um, and I would go, in the winter, I would wear shorts and sweatpants over them because minus 20 is too cold to be out in shorts and a t-shirt. But then you'd spend an hour skipping and weight lifting and all of these things, and at the end of the hour, I was warm enough to carry my coat and the sweatpants under my arm and go out in shorts and a t-shirt. And I would stop it. Canadian Tire, and people look at me funny, like, why is he at minus 20 at, in shorts and a t-shirt? What I was doing is I was, I was pretending like it was summer, and I could, but I knew that if, if, I had, if somebody said, hey Peter, I haven't seen you a while, stop and talk in the parking lot, in three minutes I start to get really, really cold. You see, that was the problem that was happening. Peter was dealing with people in the church. He knew that they were false teachers, and reality would catch up to them. Just like it would catch up to me if I stood outside for very long in shorts and a t-shirt. He knew that they, 
But in the meantime, he was warning the faithful to be on their guard against it. When Noah built the ark, he, it took him a hundred years. And he would have mockers and scoffers come every day. And, and, and their snide comments and their swearing at him. Would, and, and, and he dealt with this. And as the time went, they'd say, well, obviously the truth is telling. He's, nothing's happening. But then as it got closer to that hundred years, they would see the ark is done. And, and it may have taken months. You know, we don't think about this, but they put pitch inside and out. The, the ark is like 700 feet long. How long does it take to go like this with pitch all over? Maybe months. And these people are starting to say, you know, he's getting this ready. And they would still mock him, but it would be less, it would be, it would be a stretch. And then the animals came and showed up, and, and they'd still mock them, but it, it, it's less convincing, you know, when he says, God is going to do this, and here's the animals, and then they watch the animals go in, and the, the door close, and then all of a sudden it wouldn't be, you know, less convincing, even to themselves. And then when the rain came, and the fountains of the great deep opened up, it would be less, the swearing would be less of a derision against Noah and a realization that he'd been right and they'd missed the boat. I had to add that they missed the boat part. <laughs> I expect that you've seen videos, I watched a compilation the other day, videos of big buildings being blown up and it, you know how they, they, you see the building, it's all perfect. And then there's a little bit of dust come out the bottom, and then the whole thing drops. Well, it doesn't just happen like that. There's somebody comes, and they put up red caution tape, and they put up fences, and they put up signs, and said, this is going to come down, and then everything is ready. And a bunch of people are sent throughout the whole building saying, yelling out. This building is coming down in an hour. If you are hiding here, you must leave or you will be killed. And they go to the next floor. Peter was saying it's the last days. This is a warning. You've got to pay attention to this. The last days. Well, they were and they still. we still are in the last days. And they're still scoffing at us and it's the same kind of scoffers are saying, Nothing's ever going to happen. Well, number three is signs of destruction. Verse 7. And by his word, the present heaven and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Again, he's warning them that, that this, is, this is eminent. There's nothing you can do. You can't say, I'm holding my hands over my eyes. You know, it's not going to happen. And then he says in verse 8, Do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow with his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but all to come to repentance. In, in verse 7, Peter's like the analogy of the building coming down. He's saying the universe is coming down. The signs are here. It's going to happen. You need to get out. And he was met with derision. Scoffers are saying, like they did in Noah's time, that God is not going to do anything. People think, well, um, God is really too busy to worry about, he's got the whole universe looking after it, so he's too busy, and, and he really hasn't got time to make sure that all of his people are following all his rules to keep them safe and help them be kind to each other. Uh, he, he's got no time for that. And... Really, 
they haven't got any very good arguments to convince you that God is not in control and God is not watching. But they have one argument that is a reasonable argument. And that argument is us. They say, if God can't look after and make sure his own followers stay on the straight and narrow, why is he going to worry about us? And it's true. We're all sinners. We all fail. But even though it's their best argument, it still fails. Think of it this way. There's a tavern right up here. There isn't, but just think of, go with me. There's a tavern there. And you know Bob goes up to the tavern, and he gets drunk. And he walks home, and he staggers quite a lot. But it's only a mile. He's walking home, and he's going like this, and he's waving, weaving, and, and, but he's on the right road. His house is down there. He gets to his house. He goes up his driveway and goes in his house. In the same way, even though we stagger, even though we are not on the right road, we're still going to get there. You know, people say, I could never worship a, a God who allows all this evil in the world. And still, they, they, they say, well, I don't want you to look at my evil. That's inconsistent, really, you know. If you have to say, God, you need to look after this evil, and my evil is just as bad as others, and you need to make sure that you fix that too. No, I, 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 I've heard this verse used often, verse 8, that says, Do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that which the, with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. People use that to say, well, that's, that shows you that the six days of creation are could be a a billion years and my answer to that is people say you can make the Bible say anything you want to as long as you take it out of context and this is a perfect example of somebody doing that now time is something that God created he created DNA and atoms and and the moon and the stars and everything and he created time we, we look at time as something that's not like this, that's not like glass or water. Time is separate, but it isn't. Did you know that time, if you're at sea level, like we are right here, and you're watching your watch, and there's another identical clock at the top of Mount Everest, they run at a different time. It's only small, it's only minute. You have to have an atomic clock to do this, but gravity affects time. And so does speed. They are fair, scientists are fairly sure that but they, obviously they can't test it because no one can go at the speed of light. But they said if you are going at 90% of the speed of light, and you travel for 10 minutes, and there's somebody over here who's not moving at all, 20 minutes will pass at the same time that your 10 minutes have passed. So speed affects time too. Well, in Genesis it says that God moved on the face of the deep, and the first day of, on the first day of creation he made light, and he also made time. And on the second day, it's, it talks about separating the, the water below and the water above, the expanse of calling in heaven. Well, scientists um, theorize that in that moving the water from below to above could have moved it at many, many times the speed of light. And all of a sudden, that those stars that are out there, that people will say, well, that's a hundred million light years away. It takes, it takes light a hundred million years to get there. 
And they're saying it's 6,000 years after God created the world. So they're saying, well, obviously the, the universe is millions of years old. And the answer is, they both can be true in that if God moves light faster than the speed of light, at what time uh, uh, to create this, let me try to explain this quickly, is the fact that it can be taking millions of years for the, that to get there, but on Earth, where we are, it only took a short time. The stars appeared on the fourth day, and they're millions of light years away. The point was that whether this is interesting and whether you believe it or not, God can make time work any way he wants. He, he made time. And he's and if it works that way, and we understand that that's the case, that's really interesting. The other thing is God is works outside of time. I thought this and that it was really an interesting thought when I when I came up. When I thought about this is if someone said to you, Tomorrow, I'm going to get you to, to take into account everything. I want a complete account of what you do tomorrow. And you say, okay, I can write down, I got up at 7.15, I had my breakfast, I went to the bathroom, I had a shower. And I said, oh yes, and, and I want you to write down every thought you thought. And you said, well, that, that's, I don't know if I can think that. Because I'm thinking the thought about writing down the thought, and I've got to write down the fact that I thought about the thought. Impossible, right? But God would have no problem writing down and putting down and knowing everything you thought and did for one day. And he would have no problem writing down the thoughts and the actions of a, every person in the world for a thousand years, and everything that happened in the galaxies that are a million light years away. He's got all of that, and neither one is harder because he's all knowing. And so a day and a thousand years are the same to him in the fact that he knows everything. The song says he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got you and me, my brother, in his hands. And he has time in his hands, too. Verse 9, as I read that, I thought, that's the kind of verse that you want to figuratively put your hand over your mouth and say, Oh, yeah. Oh. The Lord is not slow with his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any of you perish, but all come to repentance. He's saying... The building's coming down. I want you to know, and I'm holding all that off, the universe is going to be destroyed. But I'm giving you time to repent, and you're wasting that time. It flies in the face of reason. Think of this as there's a fire coming. Your house is surrounded by woods, the fire's coming, and God is slowing the fire and he's holding it back and he's saying get over your house with your family and you say yeah but my favorite show is on and it's only an hour no no you don't do that soon the way will be blocked and the time for repentance will be passed so how what can we do with this well we live in the same kind of world that peter lived in a world for the most part that doesn't believe in god as they did before the flood, they're figuring if God did exist, he's too busy with other things to keep track of all our thoughts and actions. As I said before, if he's, if he can't, if he can't look after us, they've got a good excuse, but that's not really a good excuse. He can say, yes, Christians sinned, and didn't they tell you? Didn't they say to you that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? And yes, I do sin, and yes, I do struggle and fail, and I struggle again. And, 
And it's the great judgment day, and Jesus is reviewing that with them. He's saying, you blew them off. You threw their sins in their face, and with it, my plan of salvation. It all rang of truth, didn't it? And you say, I'm not interested in it. But maybe, and some people will say, well, you know, I am interested, but not right now. Maybe when I'm old, I'll be interested. And I read this Ecclesiastics, and I thought to myself, this is really interesting. Verse 3 says, In the day that the watchmen of the house tremble, and the mighty men stoop. That means, when you were young, you weren't afraid of anything, but now you're old, and, and you're like this, and you're afraid of things. And, and then it goes on to say, the grinding ones stand idle because they are few. That's your teeth. You, you haven't got as many as you did when you were 21. And it says, and those looking through the windows grow dim. Your eyes aren't what they used to be. And then it goes on to say all these things that the doors are closed and, and we forget. And then at the end it says, the, For the man goes to his eternal home, while mourners are go about in the street. Remember him, that's remember God. Remember Jesus before the silver cord is broken. And the golden bowl is crushed, and the pitcher by the well is shattered, and the wheel at the cistern is crushed. Then the dust will return to the earth. That's us. As it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. We need to remind people that, that all of that is true. And the people who are old just happen to be, have more chances to hear about the plan of salvation. And I thought to myself, you know, our community is full of those kind, those people who are old. And maybe if we could say, I think I'm going to go up to them and say, look, I'm going to give you one last chance to hear the gospel. One last, maybe you thought about it. Maybe you heard about it when you were young. And you said, when I'm old, and you're old now. And it's time to make that decision before it's too late. All men will go to your eternal home, and we would like your eternal home to be heaven with us. Because if there's any sure thing, there's only two sure things for us. Death and judgment. Not taxes. People escape taxes all the time. Death and judgment. That's the surest thing that there is. And I would hope that we would want them to be among the number who accept and, and cherish Jesus as Lord, enjoy eternity instead of spending it in regret. And sometimes people will, it's, it's the most wonderful thing. I thank you very much. I, I'm going to tell you this, my car, I was going to get Wanda to change the steering wheel in my car, and then she said, no, I don't want to. So I had to. And I took it off, and I pulled all the wires out for the signal, and then I had put them all back, and I thought I'd done them all in the right place, but then the high beams didn't work. And I spent hours laying underneath the car like this, trying to get that fixed. And I went out to the car show, and I was standing beside somebody with a 1951 Mercury, and he said, Oh, you know that those come over and, and connect to a little thing, Beside the radiator, is it plugged in good? Have you got good connections? Was I ever happy to see, hear that because it was unplugged? There, I got high beam headlights again. Just that, just that. Wouldn't it be good for somebody to say, you know, Jesus still loves you in spite of the fact that you've forgotten about him for 70 years. You got a chance. Look, just... Come to him. 